Hello, everyone. Um, so for this meeting, I'm going to be talking about this really cool um, idea of Langford pairings. It's going to serve as an introduction to a much bigger concept in computer science called exact covers, which show up everywhere. All right. So I'm going to go over what a Langford pairing is. I'm going to show they exist and exactly when they exist. I'm going to go over some stuff about how to actually like enumerate Langford pairings. And then in general, I'm going to start talking about exact covers. And we'll see how a Langford pairing will actually be an example of what are called exact covers. All right. So let's look at this list. So we have two twos, two threes, and two ones. And if you notice, each pair of digits, k, has exactly k numbers between them. There's exactly one number between both ones exactly two numbers between both twos, and exactly three numbers between both threes, right? So just to get a feel for it, um, take maybe one or two minutes and see if you can come up with a pairing for n is equal to four. Right? There are two of them. And then also, if you want to just follow along, slides should be uploaded. Um, answers to exercises should be uploaded. And also, there's source code for some of the exercises involved programming. So source code is also uploaded. So if you'd rather follow along that way or take a look afterwards. All right. You don't have an idea of appearing? All right, so for the interest of time, give both of them, and you'll see that they're reverses of each other. So we'll just say there's really one. So yeah, there's um, four numbers between the fours, three numbers between the threes, two numbers between the twos, and one number between the ones. And this is the only um, pairing for n is equal to four. Right, so it's like this um, strange arrangement of um, these integers in a list. Yes. So the reversal of the Langford pairing would also always be a Langford. Yeah, because we only just care about the relative distance. We don't yeah. really care which one comes first. So we want to figure out for what end do these Langford pairings exist? So perhaps kind of stupidly, it exists for n is equal to zero, just an empty list, but whatever. No pairing exists for n is equal to 1 or n is equal to 2, right? And let's, let's think about why. So for n is equal to 1, we just have two ones. Those are the only numbers we have. So there isn't a third number we can place in between the two ones. So no pairing exists for n is equal to 1. For n is equal to 2, so we have to put, so we have four slots. And in the four slots, we have to place the two twos. And the only way to place them, such as there's two spots in between, are on the ends. So on the um, leftmost end and on the rightmost end of the list. And then that means you have to put the two ones in the middle. And we run into the same issue. There isn't another number in between the two ones. So there's no pairing for n is equal to 1 or 2. We just saw pairings exist for n is equal to 3 and 4. Can we characterize maybe exactly for what n we can find pairings, whether even one exists, let alone multiple, right? And so here's a high level overview of what we're gonna do. We're gonna show that if a pairing exists for a given n, then it must satisfy, then that n must satisfy some sort of characteristic. And then we're gonna show that for all n that satisfy the characteristic, here's a way to generate a pairing. All right. So we're going to actually find a formula to construct these pairings. And here's a theorem from 1959 when some people started looking at these objects. So the numbers can be arranged into a pairing if and only if n is a multiple of 4 
or one less than a multiple of four. So you can write it as either 4m or 4m minus one, right? So it worked for four, it worked for three, and it didn't work for um, one or two, right? So we can kind of see this fits the pattern so far. So now I'm gonna go through um, why, if we can arrange into a pairing, it must be a multiple of four or one less than a multiple of four, okay? So suppose we can arrange this into some sort of Langford pairing. So now consider the numbers in such a pairing. So let A of R be the first time R appears in the sequence. And then since A of R is where the first time it appears, we want R numbers in between. And then the next number is going to be the second time it, um, R appears, right? So we're going to have, we're going to have um, A of R is the first index and then um, A of R plus R plus one is going to be the second index. Follow, I want to see why the second one must be plus R plus one. But we're just, really permuting these indices around, right? We have a list of length 2n, and the indices go from 1 to 2n, and then the pairing is just some rearrangement of this. So we have this sum. We have the sum of all of the a sub r's. So the, first, so the sum of all the indices for the first time the number appears, and then we're going to sum over all the times the second number, the second time the number appears. And if we just do some rearranging, right, we're gonna see that we're just gonna get this. Like, you just do the algebra and we're gonna get this. Yes. Can you look at the AR plus R plus one? Right, so A of R is the fir first time the number appears in the pairing, okay? And what's the condition? We want there to be exactly R numbers between the two R's. Right? So we want three numbers between the two threes, two numbers between the two threes. So if A of R is the index of the first number, then the next R numbers can't be that many. And then it must appear in the next number. So we have to we have to have a space of R, and then the next index is going to be the number again. That kind of clear it up? Cool. So we do some algebra, whatever. But we're summing up, right? All the indices, it must go in, each number must go into some index. So we're summing up from i is equal to one to two on all the indices. So you can do the math and you get this. So we just, we're just rearranging the indices. The order we add them up shouldn't change anything. So these two values must be equal. And so do some rearranging. The sum of all of the a sub r's must be equal to this quantity on the right. All of the a sub r's are integers themselves, right? And so if it is a valid pairing, then 3n squared minus n over 4 must again be a pairing, or must again be an integer. So if n is an integer, right? Where let's let's start looking at multiples of four or um any number one, two, or three more than a multiple of four, right? Because every number is going to be either a multiple of four or have some remainder. So n is going to take one of these forms. And then I'm not going to walk through all the algebra because it is just the algebra and seeing if you can plug this in and get an integer. So if you plug in n is equal to 4m into 3n squared minus n over 4, it's an integer. And if you plug in 4m minus 1, it's again an integer. If you plug in 4m um, plus 1 or plus 2, this quantity is not an integer. So if there's a pairing, it can't be 4m plus 1 or 4m plus 2. Does everyone see the logic? So now we've figured out why, um, if we can create a Langford pairing for n, 
n must be a multiple of four or one less than a multiple of four. And so in the same paper, he, um, in the same paper, they came up with formulas for generating a single pairing for a general n. And I'll just show you the formula. So this is the case before m. It's a mess. I'm going to be real. I don't fully understand. He, in the paper, he literally just says this works with no explanation. And you can believe me that it works if you want. Right? So wh what am I doing here? Right? So the ellipses are just consecutive even or odd terms, right? So for n is a multiple of four, we're going to start with 4m minus 4, then 4m minus 6, then 4m minus 8, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then, you know, 2m, 4m minus 2, 2m minus 3, and then we're going to count down to 1. 2m minus 3, 2m minus 5, right? You can fill in the dots. So if you were going to write this in Python, right, it would just be a range. These would just be ranges. And then a similar looking formula for 4m minus 1. But don't just take my word for that these work. It's not too hard to actually just write a Python program that will generate Langford pairings using these formulas. Or if you're just curious, I've uploaded the source code onto the website, cs3.org in the meeting section. I've uploaded the source code for actually um, creating Langford pairings using these formulas. So you can just run the code and see that it will spit out a pairing. Okay. Does anyone have any questions so far? This these formulas are mess. Like, it's if you don't have to remember them, it's whatever. But they exist. So we've shown that Langford pairings exist for multiples of four or one less than a multiple of four. All right. And so a maybe slightly more interesting question than just. Um, when do these objects exist, right? In combinatorics, we're not just, if something exists, we may also wonder how many instances of a particular object are there, right? So for a given n, um, can we actually find when, um, can we actually count the number of pairings, right? So for a large n, the number of pairings grows immensely quickly. So we know, when Langford pairings exist. And it turns out for n is equal to 0, 3, and 4, the solution is unique. So for larger n, there's many. I think for um, 7, there's 26 or so. And then when you get even, even when you get up to like 12, it gets into like the hundreds of millions. So it grows quite fast. So let L of n denote the number of Langford pairings. And we're going to count a pairing in its reverse as the same. And the current state of the matter in research is that it's quite hard to compute this value. So online, John Miller, he has a really nice history online about like people trying to enumerate Langford pairings for various n. You know, because the numbers grow quite large, people have done lots of compute power, and there's a lot of interesting work about doing math to optimize formulas and optimize like um, algorithms for computing L of n. And so in 2002, uh, Mike Godfrey came up with a formula. And if you want to see the formula in action, it's um, written out in. Art of Computer Programming, Volume 4A, Exercise 6A of Chapter 7. But here it is. Again, um, so at a high level, what's going on is you can think of the X of um, Js, like so all the X variables, as positions in our resulting list, right? And so you can kind of see that appears on the right-hand side of the definition of F, right? We have these x of j's and then x of j plus k plus one, right? So these are indices where we can actually have, um, these are indices where we can actually have 
a valid pair for a given number. And so if you work out through the details or I've written up a solution for deriving this formula, and you can see it on the website, you essentially get to so the big crux of it is that when you expand this out, all of the terms are going to have a bunch of X of I's as products, right? And it's going to turn out the only terms that have um, all of the X of I's, so meaning the only terms where we've actually assigned a number to every single index. Well, those terms are um, going to be the only ones that will cancel out in the bottom formula. So in the bottom formula, it's just we're going to plug in minus one plus one um, into the formula and try every possible combination, and you end up getting this. And it's a quite tedious but beautiful counting argument. So the point is to um, compute all the Langford pairings, people aren't actually just trying to generate all possible permutations. If you can imagine how many permutations of a list there are, even like for small n, it grows um, like factorial effects. So you can't just set your computer to run and generate all pairings, all permutations of a list and see which ones are a pairing. So this kind of gets into an area of combinatorics, which people call analytic combinatorics, and this kind of studying, or no, this is algebraic combinatorics. So it's kind of using polynomials to count certain objects. And it's an idea that kind of comes up over and over in combinatorics. And if for any of you were at Husning's generating functions meeting last um, semester, that's also algebraic combinatorics. It's using polynomials to count certain objects. And conversely, there's analytic combinatorics, which is where people just kind of come up with upper bounds and lower bounds and study these bounds and try to get better and better approximations as n tends to infinity. Because even like computing the formula right there is a little bit better. And you can actually do some really clever mathematics and use the gray codes from last meeting to, quick, to quickly compute this um, formula. But even as n gets fat, like, there's God knows how many terms in this polynomial. It's a pain in the ass. So people are also interested in just what's the behavior of this as n tends to infinity. And you get into this field of combinatorial analytic combinatorics. All right. So at the beginning, I tease this thing called exact covers. So what are they? So Langford pairings are a special case of a problem called exact cover. So in 1972, Richard Carr proved that exact cover problems are what we call NP-complete. So what does this mean at a high level? So we can verify solutions in polynomial time. These problems are hard to solve, even though they're easy to verify. And it's one of these problems where if we have an al a fast algorithm to solve exact cover, we can turn it into a fast algorithm to solve other hard problems such as like Boolean satisfiability or maybe Hamiltonian path or some other problems you guys may have heard of in your classes. So what is exact cover? So as the name implies, our goal is to cover a list of items with some chosen subsets and select each item exactly one time. And let's run through a nice example. So let's just look at this matrix. And the goal of the game is choose rows of the matrix, such that if I look in vertically along your chosen rows, each column contains only exactly one one. So for example, you cannot choose both rows um, three and four, because in the second to last column, they both have a one. So that's the forbidden choice. Then you have two ones in that column. And we can ab abstract this into some different notation for options which contain items, right? So we can see row one or option one has a one in the third and the fifth column. Row two has three items, a one in the first column, a one in the fourth column, and a one in the seventh column. 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, with the subtraction, and if you actually try to solve this, the goal is to select um, options, not items, options one, four, and five, right? We select, op um, so you can see that if you select those options, then each item, the numbers one through seven, get used exactly once. We only have one, three, we have one, 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 two, one, four, one, five, et cetera. Okay. Does everyone kind of get the idea of the exact cover problem and why it might be hard? You don't really have, like, intuitively, there isn't much better you can do than just kind of look at the subsets and start trying combinations. So, in trying to solve the previous exact cover problem, you may have, like, been running through a sort of recursive algorithm in your head quite naturally. So here's a very simple algorithm to solve exact cover. So if we're trying to cover item I, right? And we have our current options and our current cover. So if our current cover is in fact an exact cover, we're gonna turn it successfully. Otherwise, our goal is to cover item I right now. But if there's no options left to cover item I, well, then we can't do anything, so we failed. Otherwise, we haven't fully covered, we haven't found a cover, and I is uncovered, but we have some options we can try. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna separate out the items that contain I, or the options that contain I as an item, and then the options that don't contain I. And then we're just gonna try every option. So what would this have looked like in the previous matrix? You may have said, okay, I want to, I need to cover column one. So let me try an item that covers column one. This, um, so then I can't use any of the other rows that cover column one. And of the remaining rows, let me try to cover column two. And this eliminates some rows. And you kind of do this recursively. At a high level, does the, Algorithm makes sense. This is kind of something similar to what you were doing in your head when trying to actually solve the exact cover on the matrix. And so there are actually some non-recursive algorithms to do this, right? So Newth has a long chapter about solving the exact cover problems. And interestingly enough, he uses a data structure that you, a data structure you may have even seen in CS 124 or 225 for sure, doubly linked lists. And he um, quite nicely called these dancing links. And he has an algorithm, which we just call, uh, he just called them algorithm X. All his algorithms are like algorithm letter, which makes them very annoying to look up. Um, so his algorithm X uses these dancing links to solve exact cover problems. And we'll actually go through this algorithm next week. I think it's quite cool. So I said earlier that that Langford pairing is an exact cover problem, right? So how is it exactly? So let n equal four, okay? So we're gonna cover eight item, eight slots in a list, okay? So those are our items, the slots one through eight in the list. So we're going to denote these L1, L2, et cetera. And then our options can be modeled as such. And let's just look at a row by row. So in the first row of options, it's where I can place a one, right? And so if I place a one, there needs to be one number in between. So the one can go in L1 and L3, or L2 and L4, or L3 and L5, et cetera. A two can go in L1, L4, or L2, L5, et cetera. And our goal is going to be to select um, options so that each index is used exactly once. And by the way we've constructed our options, our spacing is guaranteed. Does everyone see how we can maybe use the previous algorithm to solve Langford pairings? 
You may have also done this when trying to solve the example for n is equal to four. Okay, I'm gonna place a one here, or maybe there's less options. So I'll, let's try placing a four in these indices. So now where can I place a three? Okay, this works. Now where can I place a two? Okay, that didn't work. Can I place it here? No. Okay, so my choice for three was et cetera, et cetera. And you just try this recursive algorithm to solve Langford pairings. And then so for general n, what are our items? It's going to be the indices of a list of length 2n. So the first slot all the way to the 2n slot. And then, so for some number, right, i through n, which you want to place, we need to form an option, right, l of j, l of k, right? And let's just say j is less than k to avoid duplicates. So we know our, where can we place on, where can we place i? Well, j and k must be somewhere in the list. So j and k are going to be between 1 and 2n. And k is going to be equal to, like I said earlier, the, the starting index, add the number, and then add 1. So k is equal to j um, plus i plus 1. And then so all of our items can just be created with a couple of for loops. And we can create items or we can create options. And then you can use the algorithm find cover to perhaps slowly find all solutions for general n and actually enumerate the Langford pairings. Right. Yes. Why is it better to like, I mean, you've turned a problem that didn't look np complete into a problem that not does look np complete, like generating Langford set. So maybe, so generating a Langford pairing, maybe specific cases, yes. Um, it may be, in fact, there may be some clever trick out there to actually just generate Langford pairing specifically in polynomial time. But currently, if you want to generate all Langford pairings, we don't have a better way than to generate them using um, basically like any sort of exact cover algorithm. There might be some clever optimizations you can make, but in general, no, you you can't do this in polynomial all the time, to my understanding. And exact cover problems actually appear a lot of times in in a lot of different places. So how many of you are familiar with the n queens problem? You have an n by n chessboard, and you want to place n queens on it such that they don't attack each other. That's an exact cover problem, right? You can select, right? There's maybe some more nuance in it, but it is an exact cover problem where you want to place these queens. And um, you can think of it as you want to cover the chessboard and each queen occupies some squares on the chessboard where it can attack and where it's placed. Or Sudoku is also an exact cover problem, right? Depending on where you place a number, you can no longer place another number. You can no longer place the same number in that region. Right, and while the I, the list of items and options might be quite large, there is like a natural way to, there is a way to formulate these as exact cover problems. Or you can imagine exact cover problems might be useful in like scheduling. Right, you don't maybe you don't want certain tasks to overlap. You want to make as much as efficient a use of your workers as possible. So you want to place your tasks in a way so that each worker, ideally, only has to do one thing at one time. Right, so exact covers kind of appear in many places and they're very fundamental problem in computer science. Anyone else have any questions? All right. So I'll give you this quote by Peter J. Cameron. And it kind of like does a nice job explaining like why combinatorics has like this seemingly easy, like it's easy to state things, but it's quite hard to actually work with them and like why i personally find common to be beautiful and the fact that it's all about techniques rather than results i don't personally care too much about langford parents but i think the exact cover problem in general is a very interesting problem and there's lots of cool techniques out there all right and so with that we are done here but um Here's some questions that people can work on, or there were some questions throughout the slides. If you 
feel like working on them. Um, so the first question is about, so remember how we said a Langford pairing and it's reverse where, because we're going to consider it the same, right? But in our options, we actually never considered this, right? If we had less options, then our algorithm will run faster. Maybe not significantly faster, but it'll run a good amount faster. And we'll have to actually produce less, um, we'll have to produce um, less results just to enumerate all the unique ones. So can you modify our criterion for generating the options in a way that we don't generate the reverses of solutions? And then can you use this formulation of Langford pairings um, or the one you find in the previous exercise and then use the um, program, uh, use the algorithm we just came up with, find cover, to actually find all the length for pairings, right? And as a quick check for n is equal to seven, you should get 26, not including reversals. All right, so feel free to work on those or I've coded all of these up and you can find the code on the website. But yes, thank you.